Okay, I guess I'll, I'll start. Uh, the good thing is that uh, you don't have to remember the, the, uh, anything about that last part about uh, error correcting codes. The oblivious branching program stuff is a, is a good place to, to start. So in some sense of our outline, I did the last thing uh, uh, earlier than I should have. But anyway, so single output functions. We looked at many of these restricted classes of branching programs. There's one class, read k, which turns out to be important historically um, and motivated a lot of the methods we're going to talk about. But what I'm going to focus on today uh, for this third part are lower bound methods that work for general branching programs for computing single output functions and including some applications uh, to data structure problems. So, so here's our list of branching program forms. So read k was a set of branching, progr branching programs. Every path through the branching program uh, queries each variable at most k times. And an oblivious branching program almost can be thought of as having this property because if, again, if you half the variables in the branching program are read at most 2k times. So if you just threw out the, the variables that are read the most frequently, you'd get down to something like, something like read k branching programs, even with oblivious branching programs, which is why historically read k was sort of the next thing that was considered. And the arguments that I stated there the, uh, for oblivious branching programs due to uh, Borden, Rasbarov, Smolensky actually were done in the context of read k branching programs rather than oblivious. And a Kolnishnikova, who I mentioned on the slide, she uh, passed away uh, sometime in the, the last year, Olga Kolnishnikova. Um, and she worked independently, con kind of on her own in isolation, and did some uh, really beautiful uh, work as, as part of this uh, at the same time as Bord and Rasbrov Smolensky. So the argument. Yeah, so this is what I was just saying. So if you have a length kn branching program, then at least n over 2 variables are read at most 2k times. So oblivious length kn, kind of like this read 2k. Um, you can get, um, there are exponential read k size lower bounds for simple explicit branching programs provided k is at most log n. So they were inspired by uh, this two-party communication complexity approach that we talked about for oblivious branching programs due to Bord and Rasbrov Smolensky and Akolnishnikova pretty much around the same time. There are slightly stronger lower bounds that uh, we were able to prove uh, over a very large domain for read k when k gets up to log squared n. In fact, this uh, and it's inspired by multi-party communication complexity. Um, I'm going to talk about this. It's got some drawbacks. The function is not known to be an NP for this one, where these are simple functions. And I'll talk about this more uh, in the general case. But unless we can improve the oblivious branching program lower bounds, we're not, so read k corresponds to time n times k. So n log squared n was the largest oblivious branching program lower bounds, we're not going to be able to prove stronger bounds for read k or any of this. And that oblivious case is, in fact, a bottleneck, as we'll talk about um, uh, later. So, so a read k branching program on every path through the branching program, each variable is queried at most k times. Um, unlike the read once case, it's possible to have paths through the branching program that are not taken by any input. Okay? They're not consistent with any input. In the read k restriction, we're going to assume that even those paths are restricted. This was, um, and it will turn out that our lower bounds for read k branching programs, and in fact, some of them for general branching programs, will not depend on the fact that the branching program is even deterministic. This is like the thing that Casper talked about on Monday with non-deterministic data structure. 
They'll also apply to non-deterministic branching programs. So what's a non-deterministic branching program? You might have multiple outputs that are labeled, you know, so on X1, there might be multiple places that you could go to on zero, and multiple places you could go to on one, and it accepts if there's some path that will get you to output one. So the every path constraint is even more important for non-deterministic branching programs, that it includes paths that are not necessarily consistent. So they, yeah, so they generalize branching programs by allowing many out edges from a vertex with the same label. So a, a non-deterministic branching program outputs one if and only if there's some path that X can take that leads to the one sync node, okay? And so the lower bound techniques will actually apply to these non-deterministic machines. So in Rieke branching programs, um, we can also separate levels of the hierarchy. As you get more k, there are more functions you can do. Recall that permutation function where we had row and column, which on a read once, you couldn't, it a read once branch program took a lot of, you know, had to be big. Well, that's very easy read twice. You read it once in row order, and then you read it once in column order, column major order. And so that's easy. So we can get things with read twice that you can efficiently that you can't do in read once. More generally, um, JRAM proved there are explicit functions with small read k plus one branching programs that require exponential size read k for all k up to say square root of, of log n. Even if you allow non-determinist in randomization for you read k, and this one's deterministic. So we know differences in the levels of the hierarchy. The techniques are easier than the ones for general branching programs, but they're close enough that I'm gonna not talk about them separately. I'm, they're inspi they inspired the results that we're gonna know about general branching programs, and um, particularly in the case of non-Boolean inputs. This is like the element distinctness problem where you get to read a whole number at once. Okay, and those, uh, so I'm gonna just do them, the results for them together. So, <coughs> we're gonna talk about now, the only restriction, these are general branching programs, the only thing we're gonna say is their time is k times n. So, here's um, how we start thinking about things. So this isn't a lower bound just yet, this is just how we think about, um, these uh, problems of branching programs. So here's a branching program, I've now oriented it vertically. So there's a branching program and then there's this sequence of nodes which is a possible trace of the branching program. Okay, we've broken it up into layers and now here I'm thinking of an input set D. D is either uh, zero, one or it's the numbers one through n, I'm just gonna use D for the domain you know, what each coordinate of the domain is like. So we've broken it up into layers. I haven't specified how big they are, but think about them like we thought about them before. Um, their number is gonna depend on, you know, K, which is the ratio between T and N. So let's let traces be the set of all possible sequences we could get as traces for the input is all possible sequences over all possible inputs of what those traces could be. We've got, again, L layers. So for each trace, let F sub, tra so tau is the trace, let F sub tau be the function that has value one on input X, if and only if the function has value one and it followed trace tau, okay? So now, there might be many inputs that do different things in the middle of these layers, but end up at the same point at the end of every layer and end up at one at the end, okay? That's, so when I fix tau, I get a function, f sub tau, and since the program computes the function, the function is one, it's an or over all possible traces of these f sub tau functions. And this is where 
why kind of non-determinants doesn't make any difference, because that's the fun, we're gonna, just gonna look at what it does in between, it just, we wanna know does it follow this particular uh, trace. So notice, and the, uh, this is a case for deterministic branching programs, but the, the FT in the case of deterministic branching programs are disjoint, and how many traces are there? Well, there are two to the S choices for each of these intermediate nodes. We've got one node per layer, so there are at most two to the S to the L, or two to the SL possible traces. All right, again, for non-deterministic branching program, each X may have multiple traces, and the only difference is these F tau's are no longer disjoint. That's all, that's the only difference in the case of deterministic versus non-deterministic branching programs. So, really this is gonna be the important thing. We have not too many functions, and this function sort of decomposes into these functions on these individual layers. It's basically, it goes through it went from here to here, and it went from here to here, and it went from here to here, and so on. So that's what we're gonna look at next. So an F is an OR over the traces, and there are two to the SL uh, traces. So if F is read K, um, you can show this is a property of a read K function. You can actually do something um, so if we pick a pair of nodes U, V, then we can associate that pair with a unique set of variables that is read on every path from U to V. Now I said I wasn't gonna restrict to read K, but I'm gonna mention read K at various points. So in this case, there's a fixed set of variables, and why is that? Why is it the case that we can associate a variable, a single subset of variables uh, U that's read between, uh, let's, let's call it a subset of variables, because it's read k. So look at the variables that are read over all the possible paths here. Because it's read k, we can't look at a variable that's read k times outside there. That's read k times outside. And every other variable we can look at in here. And so you could just add extra queries and make sure that all the variables that are read in each of these segments is exactly the same and it doesn't change what's going on. Okay? So, so you can do that. And so this is how the bounds of Borden, Rasmus, Smolensky, and Okolnishkova came about. You can say, well, this function is a function of subset of the variables. This function, going from here to here, is a function of a subset of the variables, and so on. So um, we have this fixed sequence of sets of variables read, which v1 through vl. So if I fix the trace tau, I get these subsets. Okay. And each of these sets is not that big because the total length is kn, and there's uh, each vi tau is less than or equal to kn divided by the number of layers. Okay? And um, so we can assign the layers for each tau just as we did with oblivious branching programs. Once I fix this trace tau, I have a fixed set of variables that are read. The order in which they're read within each segment are, you know, might vary. But exactly the same thing we said about assigning things to Alice and assigning things to Bob, that works the same here. Because that's all we use. You know, a variable is read at most k layers. You flip a coin. Uh, it, about a 1 over 2 to the k fraction gets sent to each player. So, it's not oblivious. It's not oblivious, but once I fix tau, so there are lots of different tau's. So we can sort of think, the number of different tau's is two to the SL. But once I fix one of these tau's, it's as if it were oblivious, because I have this fixed set of variables, and all I care about is, does this set of variables get assigned to Alice, or does it get assigned to Bob? I flip a coin. 
right? So each one of these F tau's in the case of a Reed K branching program looks like just um, each one of these F tau's kind of looks like an oblivious branching program. It's not, but you could the same analysis works. Okay. So we can do, assign the layers for each F tau, but of course we've got lots of different, these branching programs, that's a lot of branching programs. But each one behaves like an abbreviated branch of programs. So we get two to the SL different assignments of variables to Alice and variables to Bob, one for each trace tau. And Again, this is our recollection of what things were Dallas. You assign each layer to Alice and Bob, maximizing the number of bits per player, and this is what Borden, Rasbrov, Smolensky told us. We could assign an independent coin for each layer, have not too many uh, layers. Um, and then there was this other one from Akolnishnikova and, uh, and Aitai. So now, again, we have our communication complexity just as before, um, but because this is only a piece of the function, f tau is only a piece of f, right? We can't think about it as a single communication problem. So instead of just doing a reduction to communication complexity, we're going to look under the hood of communication complexity and see what are the basic techniques that allow us to prove communication complexity lower bounds? So this is communication complexity 101. So there's a notion, and I think, I uh, forget whether it's Casper or, or Raphael, somebody uh, pointed this out earlier in the week. There's this notion just of a combinatorial uh, rectangle. So think of all possible inputs, capital X. So this is an exponential size set. Capital X is something like 0, 1 to the n. And capital Y is 0, 1 to the n, or m, or something like that. Okay? So these are enormous sets. A combinatorial rectangle is basically a submatrix of this matrix. It's a set of inputs for Alice and a set of inputs for Bob, and all possible combinations between them. That's a combinatorial rectangle. So it's a U cross V, where U is a subset of inputs for Alice, V is a subset of inputs for Bob. Okay? And um, any deterministic protocol in which C bits are sent, little c bits are sent, yields a partition of the space into two to the C rectangles. And why is that? Well. Let's suppose Alice speaks first. There's some subset of the inputs on which she sends 0, and some subset of the inputs on which she sends 1. OK? So that was the first bit. Now Bob speaks. And Bob's going to send zeros and 1s on this part under this scheme. But maybe on the other part, he'll send zeros and 1s on this scheme. But notice that the number of rectangles we get keeps doubling at each stage, at each each round of players, the number of rectangles we get is double. The, first of all, the partition is into these combinatorial rectangles. So this is one rec this rectangle corresponds to 0, 1 communication. This corresponds to 1, 1. This corresponds to 1, 0. Uh, this whole thing is 1, 0. And this whole thing is uh, 0, 0. OK? So we get 2 to the C of them. Um, and in fact, if you look at non-deterministic protocols, you can, um, they correspond to coverings of the ones of the function by rectangles. And by the time you're done, the, the function is constant on the last rectangle. This is something I didn't say. It's two to the c rectangles on which the function is constant. When you're doing non-deterministic protocols, you're just covering the, you're covering the ones by rectangles because there has to be some transcript of the protocol that gets you uh, output. So to prove that F requires large communication complexity, it suffices to prove 
that one, well, you've got a lot of ones to cover, and any rectangle can only cover a small number of ones. Okay? So that's the general approach. This is how you can prove that, so for example, with the equality function, x and y, what do the rectangles look like? There are two to the n inputs on each side. The only rectangles you get can get are the ones on the diagonal for the equality function. So that's two to the n rectangles. Each rectangle, one rectangle, is size one. So you need n, two to the n rectangles. So the c, the complexity, is at least n for the equality function. So that's an example, even for a non-deterministic protocol. Okay, so this is if we know which bits we're going to give to Alice and which bits we're going to give to Bob. For branching program lower bounds, we don't know how um, the input, whatever it is, how those n coordinates are partitioned into Alice's bits and Bob's bits. We don't know that in the best partition case, because um, you know, with the equality function, in this version, it's hard, but if you rejiggered who got which bits, it was easy. So we have to have a function. We have to analyze rectangles in our function for all possible partitions of the input n that gives big amounts to each player. Um, this is called best partition communication complexity. And there are lower bounds node. That trick about doing those rotations that we did for the shifted equality function, turns out in general, if you have functions hard, you add rotations, it's hard even in the best partition case. But remember when we were doing oblivious branching program lower bounds, remember, if you think about it, each player got m, which is n over 2 to the k plus 1 bits, but that means most of the bits were seen by both players. So we also have to analyze what happens when most of the bits are sent. The implicitly, the rectangle size only was important relative to the size of the unfixed variables. So the fixed variables, we just fix them to some arbitrary value, and then we said, look at the complexity on the rest. And um, that business about fixing it is even more important. And so here is the general notion, and it's a little bit tricky to think about in general. Um, so think of the rectangle concept. Okay. But now we don't know which side is Alice and which side is Bob. And Alice and Bob only get a portion of the input. So an embedded rectangle, we have Alice's bits and Bob's bits, or Alice's input positions and Bob's input positions, and we've got some fixed assignment to the rest, alpha. An embedded rectangle associated with that triple, and the pair of who got, who got which bits, the AB, we'll call that the footprint. Uh, the, the fixed things we'll call the tail. Um, and then there's sort of a body, which is where the rectangle stuff is really happening. That's going to be some subset of inputs for Alice and some subset of inputs for Bob. And so this embedded rectangle has, you know, looks like a product on the bits of A cross B and then is fixed outside there. That's an embedded rectangle. So it is a rectangle also, but the point is, we really are only going to care about how big it is. We're going to care, well, how big are A and B, and how big are RA and RB? Or how big is the size of the body of the rectangle relative to um, a, the, the space of A cross, uh, DA cross AB? So the density of a rectangle, this is the parameter that's going to matter, or one of the parameters that's going to matter, is the ratio between the body size, the part that's varying, compared to the total number of possibilities in that communication problem. And that's the density. And again, the foot size of that rectangle, because that's the footprint, is the minimum number of bits that each player gets. So, so given our rectangle, 
So this is just a combinatorial object, but we're thinking about it in the context of communication complexity. This effectively is the number of bits per, or number of coordinates per player, and that's the density. Okay? So it's a rectangle where we've not decided ahead of time which part is Alice's, which part is Bob's, and we fixed everything else to some particular value. <coughs> um, for oblivious branching programs, <laughs> yes. Well, notice I could have picked a bigger A and B at the expense of making the density smaller, but the point is. Once we know the rectangle, we certainly do know, if I give you all these parameters, we, we know which side is Alice and Bob, but if I give you a function, you don't know a priori which parts are going to be Alice's and which parts are going to be Bob's. That's what I mean. No, you're right. So let's look at oblivious branching programs. For oblivious branching program, the footprint, which bits Alice got and which bits Bob got, was the same for all of the embedded rectangles associated with that protocol. It was the same. We looked at that sequence. We did assignment for that one fixed sequence that gave us the Alice and Bob. And then we got to pick the worst case um, uh, alpha. OK? Uh, and that, because it was the same, we got to use communication complexity as a black box. But in now, there's not going to be the same. Uh, it's not going to be. Um, uh, communication complexity. So what's our strategy going to be in the more general case? We're going to, again, write f as an or of functions where each, the ones of each function is a union of embedded rectangles with some foot size m. And they have this, within each fi, the footprints are the same, but they have different tails. So the footprints are the same, but so this is a union of reckon. Well, because they have different tails, they correspond to different pieces of the input, because they're going to disagree. They've got the same footprint, but different tails. So how many rectangles do we have? OK. And then the other thing is to show that any embedded rectangle with foot size bigger than or equal to m has density at most some delta. OK? So those are the two pieces. And if we have these two pieces, and this is important, so if you have questions, I want to make sure you get this. Then we know that E, the number of Fi's, times delta, has to be the ratio between the number of ones and the set of possible inputs. OK? And the reason for this is the following. So let's look at one of these fi inverse of 1. Look at how many inputs can be in there. Well, they have the same footprint. So here's ai, bi. Um, each of these, so we've got, they've got the same ai and bi. So let's look at the footprint. So each one, each rectangle, each of these embedded rectangles has density at most delta in here. So it's delta fraction of all the inputs here for each one of the rectangles. So this is a union of rectangles um, rij. So the union over j of rij. Each of these ris, this is an embedded rectangle, which has got an ai cross bi. Each one has density delta, but they've got different tails. So they disagree outside AI, BI. So there's alpha, this is alpha J, uh, right? There are different alpha J's. So this is alpha J, this is alpha J prime. They disagree out here. So these are not equal. So this means they correspond to disjoint subsets of the input. So, and for each one of these tails, we only get a delta fraction of inputs. So I claim that the size of Fi inverse 1 
is less than or equal to delta times the size of d to the n. Because each one, you know, we, you, can, you can split d to the n based on the tail. And within each tail, you're only getting a delta fraction. OK. So that gives us the bound. All right. So the whole thing is going to be, you know, what's the bound on E and what's the bound on, on delta? How many, how many different footprints do we need? And, um, and so on. So in the case of read K branching programs, there was only one footprint per trace. So there were two to the SL or LS uh, uh, different footprints we had to deal with, one per trace. In the case of general length KN branching programs, we don't know what that number could be. OK? Um, so, um, so we're going to try to get that bound as well. So fix one of these traces. So we can apply for each input x. We're fixing the traces. So in a general branching program, we don't know. We don't have these sets. They might vary. This is a function that depends on x for that particular branching program. But for each of the ones with the trace for that particular trace, um, uh, there are um, two to the L possible ways that you can split these to Alice or Bob, right? We flipped a coin. Do we do it Alice or Bob for each of these segments? OK. And let private of x be the first m variables of the private inputs that Alice and Bob would get respectively once we decide what the layers are going to be, how the layers are going to be assigned. There are at most n choose m choices for the private inputs that get assigned for Alice, and m choose m choices for the private inputs that get assigned to Bob. OK? So that's m choose, n choose m squared. And so um, the claim is once we fix the choice of these private inputs, we get, um, once we fix the choice a, b, we're going to get embedded rectangles um, with that particular footprint. So if we've got A and B are disjoint, we've got a fixed trace, fixed layer assignment, look at all inputs that get private of X being A and B, traces tau, we assign the layers to Alice and Bob according to this assignment, and we fixed, uh, and we fixed this outside, that's an embedded rectangle in AB with footprint, uh, you know, in, that's entirely contained in the ones of the function. OK? So there, we can basically what we're doing is we're getting an upper bound, which is the number of traces times the number of layer assignments times the number of ways we can split the variables between Alice and Bob. So that's 2 to the L times n choose m squared times 2 to the SL, which is our number of traces. OK? So, um, and so this says we can choose the number of rectangles be 2 to the SL times 2 to the L times n choose m squared. We get embedded rectangles. Because basically, the program is going to behave exactly the same. Um, uh, on F tau is going to behave exactly the same on all inputs with this property, because it's uh, that output one. So, uh, and this is this claim. So I did it. Um, this is the claim uh, that we made. And here's sort of the picture proof. So I've taken the parts of the uh, program, colored them by the layer assignments. Now it's red and purple instead of Alice and purple. Uh, so if we have two different assignments, right? So we have this assignment, which goes through those nodes and has the particular trace, and this assignment. Then, um, whoa, what happened here? 
um, I'm supposed to have animation. We can combine them in any arbitrary way. So, oh yeah, so here's, here's the, so we have the straight input, we got the wiggly input. The program is gonna be the same if I combine them by, this is a little bit of the straight one and a little bit of the wiggly one, the program will behave the same. And so that's an embedded rectangle. Okay, so, um, so that's our claim. Uh, so now we can take our, our, our bound and we get this bound, two to the SL times n choose m squared. And so we've got this bound, what about part two? And I'm not gonna prove this for any function, unlike before. We wanna show that any embedded rectangle with foot size m has density at most, delta. It turns out, so this cannot be smaller than d to the minus 2m, because the sizes of these feet, feet is d to the m. So that would be just one point. d to the 2m would just be one point. But there are functions where we can get d to the minus epsilon m. So the delta is really tiny. And here are some functions. One is the Hamming separation problem. So it's like the element distinctness problem. Um, uh, oh, I see the inputs have disappeared. But if you have some pair that are bigger than, so they're functions on end of the C bits, just like our element distinctness function, you want to know, is there some pair so are all of them very far apart in Hamming distance? Typically, they'll be about half the Hamming distance. This says they're at least one minus gamma of the Hamming distance. So Itai showed that that has this type of property. Yukna showed membership in linear codes of sufficiently large field size also have this property. And um, Sauerhoff and Wolfel showed that if you do integer multiplication of numbers where the domain is b bit, so you've got n b bit blocks where you think of b as uh, it also has this property. So all have, each of these functions has fairly large ones, so here's the lower bound. So if you use the layer assignment we had before, um, e times delta, well, not a, it doesn't always work. That random assignment fails some of the time, so you can't get it for all inputs. Previously, we were doing it once, and we could say it always, you know, you could pick one value, it always worked. Now, you just, it works on average or almost certainly, so you get, you have to throw out some of the inputs. So, um, and now we've got our bound on the number of, on, on the number of rectangles we've got and on our delta, and when you plug it in, well, n choose m squared, well, m is n over 2 to the k, so uh, that gives you the 2 to the k, so you get a 2 to the km. And if your field size, if your coordinate size is sufficiently big, like 4k over epsilon, then 2 to the sl, when you plug all this in, has to be relatively large compared to your domain size. Taking logs, s times l is big, and plugging it in, you get a time equals basically n log n over s. So essentially the same kind of bound that we were able to prove for oblivious branching programs. So if, if s is n to the 1 minus epsilon, you get t is omega, omega log n, n log n, for these functions like Hamming distance, uh, delta, and so on. And so these are uh, this is in a paper with uh, J.R.M. Sachs, and actually the final, the nicer version of it is in paper with Sachs, Sun, and V. Um, I'm going to skip the application to lambda nearest neighbor. There's a theorem. You can get a lower bound on it from that. Um, uh, if, so what about Boolean domains? So we needed in this that the domain size had to be at least 
like 2 to the k over epsilon or something like this. We needed big domain size. For a function like element distinctness, the best rectangle you could bound you can get is like 2 to the minus epsilon n. And Boolean domain is even worse. So um, I tied to find a particular explicit cubic form, which is given by a matrix whose entries are filled in from y, x transpose x, that also requires this kind of, of delta. So his, it's basically plug in the values of y. It's a Henkel-type matrix, except you zero out the part above the diagonal. Or alternatively, it's the same function, a Boolean function, which gives the number of pairs i, j, such that i is less than j, x i, x j, and x i plus j are 1 is a lot. So that's a function. And there's a much more complicated argument that holds, doesn't work in general non-determinism, but only for small amounts. He uses the fact there are correlation between private x values, um, got a different independent si layer assignment, much more complicated. And you can get lower bounds even for Boolean functions or element distinctness that are a little bit worse than this. They get a square root of log by log log. Um, so this is the best lower bound known for any Boolean function. OK? And also best for element distinctness. Though other functions like this Hamming distance function or middle bits of multiplication and so on, those are, those are hard. We can do better for certain functions. Um, using multi-party number on the forehead communication complexity, there's a similar notion of embedded cylinder intersection instead of embedded rectangles. And we can get kind of like an n log squared lower bound. This is work with v. There are some drawbacks. One is it's not known to be, the function is not known to be an NP. And the other is the domain side actually needs log cubed n bits to be represented. OK? So more to the point, I want to talk about open problems. Um, so we don't know lower bounds for general branching programs for simple problems like graph reachability, directed graph reachability. With pointers, we know you can solve it easily if you've got like out degree one nodes. But what about out degree two, which is essentially the equivalent to the general case? Can you do connectivity, general connectivity? Savage's theorem says that you can do this in space log squared n. Um, and we don't know whether space log n is possible at all. It would imply non-deterministic, if you could, it would imply that non-deterministic log space, the non-uniform version, is the same as deterministic log space. Um, uh, and even if we can prove that, prove that if the space is log n, that you need at least n squared time, or n to the 1 plus epsilon time. Or even at least match this kind of a lower bound for uh, out degree 2 reachability. So that's one bound. Um, improve the best lower bound from Boolean functions from this, which we can prove for Boolean functions, to this, which we can prove for higher, um, for non-Boolean functions. Um, OK, so um, here's one which is really the, the crux of the limitation of current methods. Prove that any oblivious branching program for any single output function that gets you something that's better than n times polylog, or even beat n log squared n. That's open. Um, so this problem, by the way, sorry, uh, let me back up. This problem is been, has been open for 25 years. The communication, the method we do, that uses is number on the forehead communication complexity and getting the number of players to be bigger than log n. That's an open problem that would have many other consequences. And people have tried to prove lower bounds for multi-party communication complexity for more than log n players for 
most of those 25 years, or 27 years, or whatever it is right now, without success. It seems unlikely that, and doing that would have lots of other implications in circuit complexity. So it seems that we will need other techniques than multi-party communication complexity in order to get lower bounds that beat this n log squared n for, uh, for branching programs. Um, yes, yeah, so the prove it for a wider range of functions, and then we have the same problems uh, that we had before that I mentioned in the, the first talk. Get, prove that uh, error correcting codes that are asymptotically good require time space product n squared. So there are a lot of other open problems related to non-deterministic branching programs. There's a whole range of problems, but uh, this gives some flavor of, of where we are. For general branching programs, we're really in this sub n log n range, and um, it would really be nice to you know, get better bounds, and graph reachability is a favorite problem, error correcting codes, Bozzi meter is a favorite problem, and they're, they're uh, quite a few others that have, uh, you know, uh, fairly broad interest. And actually, there are a lot of problems that haven't been studied, even for proving uh, multi-output lower bounds. Um, there was a lot of work in the 80s, early 90s, and there's been much less recently for multi-output functions. So uh, lots, of, lots of options. Um, so, yeah, thank you.